Welcome back, ladies and germs, to another episode of Manga Transdub Theater, where we take public domain Japanese comics, English-size them, and then to make funny noises. I'm your host, translator, sound engineer, director, and local fishmonger, Nicholas Tyson. Today, we have the man, the legend, the, to be honest, kind of a scumbag, <laughs> the one and only Okamoto Ipe. Um... Ipe is a complicated guy. He's very funny. Uh, his his comics are very interesting for a whole number of reasons. But he was very much a jerk to his arguably more famous wife. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what I have for you is the title story from a collection of what Ipe refers to as Ega Shosetsu. And you can see that there in the title card if you are a Japanese reader. Ega shosetsu or film stories. So these are comics as film movie film strips, basically. The title of the collection, and thus of this particular story, as you can also see here, again, if you read Japanese, is Onna Hyakumenso, or Woman's Hundred Faces. It literally says Hyaku, hundred, um, but it's probably better to understand it here as a lot or many. So maybe a better translation would be a woman's many faces. Anyway, let's get started. Ms. Tameko, after many weeks of pestering her husband, has finally got him to promise to take her out this Sunday so they can see the autumn flora. Unsure whether the morning might be bright or dreary, she makes up her face with a weary eye for the radiant patterns up above. Her face she powders and highlights her cheeks in rouge. Some features she enhances, others she diminishes, as her companion holds up the mirror. She makes certain the face she puts on conceals all those little things she would never reveal to her man. This, then, is her expression as she dons her kimono, and her lady's maid sets the collar in order. Here we see her leaving the house face. She keeps up appearances for the benefit of the neighborhood gossips and walks with just the right distance between herself and her husband. Her face has entirely dispensed with the ordinary and the day-to-day, -day, so much so that every person she runs into wonders just who this woman is. She rides the train as it lurches and rumbles, and as a result we see her face of sudden surprise. Later, she and her husband enter the hundred flower garden in Mukojima. In this refuge from the hustle and bustle of city life, she feels completely at peace. As Ms. Tamako sips giddily at her cup of shibucha, her face seems to say, Ah, now this is truly the good life. She strolls about the garden. Alas, the moving sound of insects crying out from the thicket. <laughs> ah, the joy and sadness of it all, her face says, straining to hear above the din. She tries making her way down a tunnel made from climbing bush clover. As Tomiko struggles to pass through the dense brush, uh, Oh, what? what? Ah, ah, her face moans and groans. This is ridiculous! Now I have the morning's gentle dew running all down my neck. As the couple make their way back along the embankment, Tamako's husband happens upon one of his co-workers on his way to the office. What do we have here? While the men chat, they seem to be keeping solely to themselves. Her husband calls Tamako over for introductions. Then, out of the blue, the co-worker grows quite serious. It's on. This is quite the dilly-dally romance you have going on here. You should consider yourself quite fortunate, madam. All right, so the little... I should explain. The little beep there was because in the Japanese, the, the dude's name is obscured. I don't really know why. Anyway. He says, thinking only to flatter. In response, Tamako's face breaks out in profound embarrassment. It's getting to be just about that time. We should head somewhere for a bite to eat. But the restaurants around here all seem so expensive. 
Okay, then, where should we go? Indeed, where should we go? All this and more, their faces seem to worry. By and by, they make their way to where there are a number of perfectly tolerable culinary establishments. Ugh, my feet are killing me, her face seems to say. The food arrives. After a while, her face seems to say, I'm the only one who appears to be actually eating. Their bellies full, the couple find their way to a motion picture theater. First up is a long, tragic feature film. Her face can hardly bear the weight of tears welling up in her eyes, unwittingly won over, as they were, to the spectacle before them. Next up is a friendly little chaplain comedy. The force of her lower belly jiggling causes her slack jaw to laugh, it too in motion with the picture. An Autumn Night Lured by the glow of the street lamps to wander by the storefronts, there in the shop window she spies the latest fabric patterns. Her face grows wide with eyes that see nothing but what is before them. Then, a face to coax her husband. My dearest darling, this is the one thing I desire most in the entire world. So he buys her the bolt of fabric, her face perfectly suited for clutching it to her breast. Her husband complains of a dry throat, so the couple pop into a nearby cafe. One might never suspect just how intoxicated Tamiko's husband has become, and so, as they race from the cafe to catch the train, he suddenly gives voice to a rather naughty distemper. Tamiko's face, her voice crying out, pleads for him to stop. Husband and wife just barely make the last train, but in their faces one can see how peace now reigneth over the land. On a clear fall day, Ms. Tamiko has just sent her husband off to work, and she makes up a to-do list for the day's chores. She wraps her head in a towel, ready to get down to work. All right, then. It's high time I tidied up all the dirty laundry in our closet. She opens the closet door to peek inside and discovers a completely different pile from the one she'd, assume, she'd assumed to be there, with an overcoat folded over the top to conceal it. This won't do at all. Who's responsible for this? Her face cries out to whoever committed this offense. There slips from the pocket of one of her husband's heaped-up jackets a calling card with the name Akia Kikunoko written upon it. Her face grumbles. I'm gonna wring his grubby little neck! She stuffs the card into her obi and makes up a face that says, When that son of a bitch gets home, I'll set him straight. But only after the hairdresser has come for her regular appointment can she get to the bottom of the matter. Till then, nothing can be done. She puts up a face that, though unwilling, says with poise and grace, Do as you must. Here we see her face as Tomiko's hair is combed out. Madam's maid is a marvel to behold, quoth the hairdresser, trying to flatter her. Know that I am but an old woman. My beauty has almost entirely faded away says the hairdresser's face, attempting to draw out pride from an excess of humility. Tamiko's face meets the mirror, and the hairdresser takes her leave. On the mirror's surface, a voice says, Why, hello there, Mr. Fishmonger. How do you do? So stepping outside, with calculated discretion, Tamiko chooses among her many options. She settles on a small mackerel. But when she hears the price... What? Twenty-five sen for a single fish? We cannot consume with such abandon, her face says, in complete shock. Tamiko's next-door neighbor has emerged from her front gate, holding a baby in her arms. ba 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 Baby, her face says, 
as she rocks the child back and forth. In this woman's company, Tamako still wears the towel the hairdresser wrapped her hair in, but then the figure of her husband appears in the distance. She helps her husband out of his clothes and puts on such an air of indifference <sighs> that he has to ask, What's the matter with you today? To which her face says, plainly, after a moment, Oh, nothing much. Sitting opposite one another, they have their evening meal. Little by little, she builds up the courage to challenge her husband. My dear, I have here what appears to be a calling card. She fully expects him to make a number of excuses, like, What? I, 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 she's just a friend I chum around with. Excuses to which she might pointedly turn up her nose. But, angered by his wife's impertinence, he storms off to his study. Here! She looks to the object before her, a photographic print of the one and only Akia Kikunoko, as secretary for the ladies' patriot auxiliary at 65 years of age, she was canvassing the neighborhood to help provide relief for those young men about to be shipped off. Okay, so a couple of brief asides. You'll probably notice that um, what I'm saying at this particular moment doesn't really seem to correspond to the image on the screen. This is sort of a problem of Ipe's comics, that there's not always a perfect correspondence between the image and the text. It's a, it's a weird thing. Also, um, a note about Japanese imperialism in the early 20th century. Uh, so the, the boys about to be shipped off are probably engaged in any of a number of Japan's imperial adventures at the time, be it in Korea or Manchuria. It's sort of a dark stain on Japanese history. Anyway, that's what it's referring to. Sorry, to continue. All Tamiko can say, realizing this woman was the cause of her jealousy, is a meek, Oh, dear. Her husband shows her one more photograph he has retrieved from the study. This photo depicts Ms. Tomiko in the girlish figure of an unmarried Kwai baby. Darling, where on earth did you find this... thing? Please, tell me. No. I said, please? No. He snatches the photograph back from his wife, and so their daily comedy of errors continues apace. Satisfied with what he has wrought, her husband returns to his study. While Tomiko catches up on her reading over a cup of tea, only a short, after only a short while, she lets out a single yawn and says, I suppose I'll turn in, as the clock dings 11. Which, in case you're paying attention, is not actually the time that's on the clock in this image. <laughs> anyway. December draws near, and with it comes notice of a 30% increase in next year's rent. Ms. Tomiko is now pregnant, her belly grown quite full, and before long, her child will be born. With that and the rise in rent, how will they manage to go on living the way they do? She gets it in her head to move, so she discusses with her husband where they might go. Her husband, carefree as ever, wonders, Hmm, what should we do? Hmm, I suppose there's no need to rush things, as he gingerly lets the conversation sink in. Tomiko sees what he's doing, and fetches from the kitchen a lone pickled daikon to dangle before his nose. My dear, nowadays, this single pickle costs us 35 sen. In no time at all, we will have a child to care for, a child who should be our first concern. Her husband's eyes grow wide. You're right. This won't do at all. We move at once. In a world where privation prevails, the scarcity of rooms to let means even those apartments going for much more than a pittance are decidedly second-rate. That said, in a ramshackle old hut, 
one can at least rent peace of mind for as little as 30 or 40 yen. This will just have to do, even if, at first, these apartments are not exactly unoccupied. Tamako isn't even looking very hard, and already she's itemized a number of discounts that will have to enter into the deal. Things to discount are practically crying out to be noticed, so with suspicious, haughty, but discerning eyes, she casts her gaze about the apartment from its tippiest top to its dingiest bottom. On the day of the move, Tamako carries out all the fragile items from the house herself, and so each person, person she passes feels the need to comment, Oh, it looks like you're moving. Say, have they found a tenant for your old place yet? Uh -huh. oh. Much to her annoyance, telling evidence of the hardships born from a dearth of homes to rent. Uh, how often the curtain rises on the confused comedic turmoil of moving day. With her lady's mouth, the servant gives voice to satire as she tosses shoes into a bucket of pickling spices. Seems these are not yet ripe! <laughs> One might think this kettle is crawling about on its own, but in fact, it's been tied to the cat so that neither can run away. She digs the unused iron rice pot out from under the porch, along with the firewood, so that when it's time to make dinner, she won't have to make a scene when she can't find it. The next day, Tamiko visits her younger sister, who is sick with the flu. On her way back home, she lets out a sneeze <gasps> Achoo! as she walks along the riverbank. Along with the sneeze, she spits her false teeth onto the hat of an old hunchback walking beside her. She attempts to save face by delicately explaining the situation as she returns the false teeth to her mouth. <sighs> Am I infected too? she worries. Later that day, She's in turmoil over whether the illness she has contracted will grow more serious and require a doctor. Her husband has quit work for the day, the evening of the 27th, just as tw sunset draws near. She hears him calling out from the entryway. Tomiko! Tomiko! Get up! Get up! With this 12% bonus, my salary has gone up a whole 3%! She cannot help but leap to her feet. Well then, I can't just sit here wallowing in misery. I've got to bulk up if I'm to be ready for spring. <laughs> and scene. Well, thank you all once again for watching this episode of Manga Transdub Theater. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you really like this video, you can support my work on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash it came from the manga, all one word. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and the links for those can be found in the description below, along with a link to the Patreon as well. I'll be back next week with another episode, but until then, don't let the man get you down. Bye!